Welcome. My name is Jeff South. I am the pastor at Ruby Mountain Bible Church. And what I'm doing here is I am placing uh, some teaching in a virtual format in order to really create a couple's course through the book of Song of Songs, or also known as Song of Solomon. And the purpose of this is, of course, because I've gotten a lot of requests to put some of this material together. Um, I've also had a number of uh, counseling scenarios over the years of my ministry. Marriage counseling is perhaps the number one uh, source of, of or subject of counseling that I do. And nearly every time, what I do when in a whether it's premarital counseling, whether it is crisis uh, marital counseling, whether it is just trying you know maintenance upkeep marital counseling. Uh, no matter what kind of marital counseling I do, I always take couples through the book of Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs. It is the biblical handbook on marriage. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Uh, I was actually just coming out of college when I had a friend of mine who was getting married, and his pastor at his church was working through the book of Song of Solomon. And up to that point in my life, I'd only read the book a couple of times, never studied it or given it any serious thought. But having learned of that series, it was helpful for me later, when I myself got married, about a year later, to go through that series myself. And to be honest with you, it changed my life. My understanding of the book, the biblical book of Song of Songs, just grew exponentially. It exploded. And it has become one of my most frequently consulted books in the Bible, obviously for my own life and marriage, but as well in a counseling scenario. And it's, it's, it's a marvel to me that every single time that I work through this book, I find something new. Every single time I take a couple through this book, uh, I find something new. And I've probably worked through the book a little over 30 times up to this point in my ministry, working through, again, marital counseling of all sorts. And what's so profound about it to me is that the book of Song of Songs in the Bible is timeless. Yes, it was written millennia ago, and yet history in the world really hasn't changed that much. And so, as a result, it is timeless. The principles and the patterns laid down in this book uh, to every couple that I've ever taken through this, they, they have all said unanimously that they, they are in awe of how contemporary this book is, how it is a love story, yes, between Solomon and Shulamite in the days of old, and yet it is so contemporary. It speaks to us in our place, to our issues that we all struggle with. And so the purpose of what I'd like to do here for the next uh, several sessions, I don't know how many we, it'll take to get through, but the purpose of this course is to basically provide marriage counseling, some, whether it's uh, premarital or, or crisis situation in your marriage, whatever the case might be, the purpose of this course is to be a couple's course. Husband, wife, do it together. Follow the homework. Um, you will only get out of it what you put into it. And I greatly encourage you to make the most of this study. The content, of course, will be the book of Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, as it is called in the Bible. And so aptly, I am abbreviating this couple's course, SOS. Yes, that is kind of a terrible pun, but Song of Songs, S-O-S, also uh, the signal for distress uh, from, you know, save our ship, as they say in Morris Code. But the point is, many marriages are in that sort of S-O-S sort of situation where you're crying out to help and for help, and perhaps you are, are watching this here today because you are in the place where you need help. Maybe this is your last-ditch effort before you give up and you assign divorce papers and you call it quits on your marriage and, and maybe you're just trying to find some level of hope. And let me just encourage you, hope is out there. The Bible promises this to us. I myself has, have witnessed what God can do through his word in the lives of people. Our church is filled with people that could give testimony of having a marriage on the precipice of total uh, annihilation and disintegration. They just about went over the cliff in their marriage, and yet God, through his grace, used a course just like this one to get them thinking biblically, 
to bring them to a level of honesty and transparency with one another in their marriage relationship. And from there forward, they were able to rebuild and renew their relationship. And they're much stronger today than they ever have been in their marriage. That is my hope and prayer for you. And so that's the purpose of this course. And the content will be the biblical book of the Song of Solomon. I will occasionally make reference or book recommendations to other books, perhaps, that might you, you might find helpful. But the primary text is the biblical book of the Song of Songs. The length of this course, typically, when I take people through this course, it's roughly eight weeks, uh, give or take. So I'm going to do my best to condense these sessions to less than an hour per session. But I will also, at the end of each session, give homework. And again, I encourage you to do the homework. You will only get out of this course what you put into it. Please make this a priority. If you want to invest in your marriage, if you want to deepen your marriage, if you want to save your marriage, then please take this seriously. I'm doing everything I can to try and be a help to you. Now, as we talk about the biblical book of the Song of Psalms or the Song of Solomon, most of the people that I talk to and interview when I begin a, a book study through the Song of Solomon with somebody, I, I typically ask, hey, how many of you have read the book? So far, it is a pretty low percentage. Several will say, well, I read the book maybe when I was in high school. I read the book, ah, I was in college. Or, you know, I might have read it once, or I didn't get all the way through it. I couldn't understand it. It was, you know, whatever. And most people that I talk to are not familiar with this book. Even if you have read the book of Song, Song of Solomon, most people do not have a very firm grasp of its contents. And so that's our goal. That's what we're going to do in this course, the, this couple's course through the Song of Songs, is I want to take you through this book so that you become familiar with it, that you become acquainted with it. I have, again, I've gone through the book in a couple's sit-down counseling setting over 30 times, uh, more than that, just personally, and it is like an old friend of mine. I love to sit down and get reacquainted with this book every opportunity I get. And what you need to know about this book to begin with, it is authored by a guy whose name is Solomon. Solomon is uh, one of the famous kings in Israeli history. He's probably less famous than his father, David. David, who is the, right, the whole David and Goliath, and more people are familiar with David and the accounts of his life. Solomon is the son of David, the next king of Israel. But you also need to realize that according to the scripture, Solomon was a man of incredible wisdom as well as wealth and folly. He was a man of wisdom, wealth, and folly, as I like to summarize. Solomon was, of course, a young man when he takes the throne. He's probably late teens, uh, perhaps early 20s, but most likely late teens when he takes the throne and his father dies, and he is then, of course, visited by God in a dream. And God appears to Solomon and says, basically gives him a blank check. This is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 3. And God says to Solomon, what do you want? And I will give it to you. And Solomon, largely, I believe, based upon the prayers and guidance of his father, David, he is wise enough, Solomon is wise enough to ask for wisdom. So God blesses him with supernatural wisdom. Solomon is the wisest man who ever lived. But because he asked for wisdom in order to guide the nation of Israel, God then also blessed Solomon with incredible wealth. He's the wisest man who ever lived and the wealthiest man of his day. And yet there's a dramatic irony to Solomon's life. If you know much about the life of Solomon, he lived and reigned for 40 years. Well, he lived longer than that. He lived to about 70. But he ruled for 40 years, or excuse me, he didn't make it to 70. Uh, he was in his 60s. But he, he rules for 40 years. The first 20 years of his reign are characterized as being godly. He is following the ways of his father David, as the Bible puts it. He is uh, pleasing God and honoring God. But a dramatic thing happens. There's a shift in his life. And this is the irony. The wisest man who ever lived also became a fool. The Bible says that he kind of went off the deep end. He multiplied wine, women in song, if you will. He pursued a life of frivolity. And as a result, he really led the nation of Israel into apostasy. And it is a really sad thing. That's, that's not the end of the story. If you continue reading your Bible, you get the book of Ecclesiastes. And it tells us very clearly that in the, eight, the latter 
days of his life, as Solomon is an aged man, he does come back to the Lord. He recognizes that his actions were, of course, foolish. And many people will pose this issue to the book of the Song of Songs when they say, well, wait a minute, if Solomon's supposed to be the wisest man who ever lived, and yet he went off the deep end, and he had like a thousand wives, well, 700 wives, 300 concubines, then why should we listen to him and what he has to say about marriage? Didn't he blow it? Well, that's a fair question. Let me address that right away. First of all, the Book of Song of Solomon was written when Solomon was a young man. He wrote this, clearly, as we read the Book of the Song of Solomon, uh, he, it was written when he was very young. In fact, if we were to date the book, we understand that Solomon rules from about seven, uh, or excuse me, 971 to 931 BC. He will die, and his young his son, well, eldest son, will take over the kingdom of Israel, and then it will cause a civil war, and the nation will split. But during that 40-year window of Solomon's life, in the early, early stages, the first 20 years of his reign, is when he writes the Book of Song of Solomon. Best we can tell, he's described in the Book of Song of Solomon, in chapter 5, we'll get to that, but it's very clear that he is in his youth. He's in the prime of life. And as a result, he this, this book is written, it's when Solomon is essentially, uh, fall, he meets and falls in love with a woman named Shulamite. This is his first wife, first marriage. And this is, of course, inspired by God. The, the book of the Song of Songs is inspired by God to give us a portrait of what marriage ought be. It's a very realistic picture. We're going to see that Solomon and Shulamite in their marriage relationship, we will see them pursue marriage. They will uh, enjoy the pleasures of marriage, but then they're going to fight and they're going to work through the problems of marriage. And as a result, their path is what is so instructional for us, is that we can all see our story in and through their story. But the fact that Solomon is not a perfect man and that Solomon himself failed in this area does not negate the value of the book itself. In fact, every book of the Bible was ultimately authored by the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God did use fallible men to write the Bible. What they wrote through the miracle of inspiration is nonetheless infallible. But we do not gauge the character of the book based solely upon the character of the man who wrote it. Rather, God supernaturally has given us what we need concerning life and marriage through this book of the Song of Songs. Now, one more tidbit on this. We don't know this for sure. Uh, it, is a, it is a strong possibility, but it's ultimately a conjecture. Many scholars believe that Solomon and Shulamite, when they get married, Shulamite is Solomon's first wife. And according to our timeline, what we know from history, Solomon does not begin to multiply wives until halfway through his reign, the 20-year mark through his reign. He has a bit of a midlife crisis, if you will. We don't know this for sure, but some scholars conjecture that Shulamite is dead by then, that his first wife, the love of his life, is what she passed off the scene. And that may well be one of the things, the triggers, that threw Solomon into a midlife crisis, bringing about his ultimate pursuit of folly, and yet for those about 20 years where he increases wine, women, and song, idols, idolatry, etc., but then he comes full circle and he gets right with God at the end of his life in the book of Ecclesiastes. But either way, the study of the book of the Song of Songs is this is the marriage handbook that God has given to us to equip us with what we need to know on how to live life in this thing the Bible calls marriage. But with that said, let me just clue you in with a couple of things when it comes to the nature of the book. Most people have a very difficult time as they read the book of the, of the Song of Songs because it's difficult to follow. It's difficult to understand and to interpret. In fact, it's ranked right up there with the book of Revelation as one of the most difficult books in the Bible to interpret. The reason for this is because it is a song. It's highly poetic in nature, and again, it's the song of songs. The Bible tells us that Solomon wrote over a thousand songs, but we only have a couple of them preserved in the Psalter, and then we have this book. But this, apparently, is the song of songs. That's a superlative, meaning 
This is the greatest song that Solomon ever wrote. This is his masterpiece. This is his grand achievement, is this song. But because it's a song, it is poetic in nature. Lots of metaphor and simile and lots of condensed, dense language. It is rich with imagery. But as a result, it can be difficult to follow at times. Also, it's not only a song, but there will be multiple characters that I'll introduce to you in just a moment that come in and out of the song. In other words, it really reads almost like a script to a musical drama, a play. And as a result, we're, the primary character that we're going to hear speak and sing in this song. We've lost the music to this song. That's long gone and lost to history. But nonetheless, we have the script. We have the words of this song. And the primary character of this song is Shulamite. Shulamite and Solomon are the two primary characters. Solomon is, of course, the king of Israel that we just introduced. Shulamite is the love of his life. It, they, they meet, and we'll talk about the story, the background story in just a moment, but they meet, and it's love at first sight. They, they court, they get married, they have issues and problems in their marriage that they must work through, and as we watch their story, we learn. Mainly, the primary speaker in the book is Shulamite. She, the, the story is essentially told from her perspective. The second most common speaker in the story is Solomon. The third group uh, of, of characters would be the daughters of Jerusalem. We'll talk about that, them more in due time, but they are essentially the young, eligible women, the virgins that live in the city of Jerusalem. They're city girls, and they pre present the main rivals to Shulamite throughout the book. We also see the brothers of Shulamite enter the scene. They only appear twice, and they, they play a very minor role in the book, but nonetheless, they are essentially uh, they, they do play a couple of key, uh, in a couple of key scenes, they play a role in the life of Shulamite. And then we have a group of characters known as the Companions, which are essentially the, the fellows of Solomon. They are his friends. Uh, they are his, it uses, it's just translated companion in many Bibles, probably his friends, sometimes maybe his, part of his entourage, uh, maybe the kingly court, but they're people associated with King Solomon. So these are the primary characters that we're going to see in the book, and we'll watch those, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. But what makes the book so difficult is most people don't know who is speaking at any given time. Some of your Bible translations, depending on what Bible translation you read and you use, many Bible translations will attempt to put headings in the book. That as you're reading, they give you a heading. Solomon, Shulamite, Daughters of Jerusalem. And they're trying to give you clues as to who is speaking. Because if you can identify who the speaker is in any given verse, then you can basically help, that will vastly help you as you piece together the story. But we do have clues about this. I'm not going to get long and hard on it. I'm basically just going to teach and, and tell you who's speaking in any given passage. But we know primarily through the study of the original Hebrew. The Bible was written, the Old Testament that is, was originally written in Hebrew. Hebrew, along with many languages, is, uh, they, they have gender markers. In other words, we know if it's a woman or a man who is speaking. It is also speaking in the singular or in the plural. Those clues, then you provide in the context, we can basically come to a pretty solid conclusion who, which character is speaking in any given verse. But there are some verses that are uh, disagreed over and there's some discrepancy. But what I'm going to basically give you, I'm not going to try and get lost in all those details. I'm just going to try to give you the gist of what's going on and to try and summarize and make this as practical a course for you as a couple uh, as possible. So that's our goal. Now, let me tell you the backstory before we jump into the text itself. The Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, is essentially the Cinderella story of the Bible. Solomon is the king of Israel, but he will meet, court, and ultimately wed a peasant girl from the mountains of Lebanon. In fact, if you were, if you were to look at this upon, up on a map, let me just draw your attention. Here is Jerusalem. You see that up on the screen? Jerusalem is the capital city of, of the land of Israel. That is where Solomon has built a palace. That is where the temple uh, will be built later in his reign. And 
this is the, the really epicenter of Israeli culture and politics, right down here in the city of Jerusalem. Well, far up here to the north, in a region known as Lebanon, it is a very mountainous region, heavily wooded. But that is a region where Shulamite is from. Solomon, king of Israel, living down here in the capital city, owns a vineyard. And we're just piecing this together as we get clues from the book itself. And then we can kind of piece together how they met in their storyline. But Solomon is the king of Israel, and he owns vineyards and flocks, the Bible says, and he's a very wealthy man. Well, one of the vineyards that Solomon owns is located up here in the mountainous region of Lebanon. Well, he apparently goes up there at some point to investigate the vineyard. He takes a look. And there, though Solomon owns the vineyard, there is a family, or perhaps a group of families, that are given the vineyard to be the keepers of the vineyard. This idea of a vineyard owner versus a vineyard keeper shows up in many parables of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. Perhaps you're familiar with that. Well, Shulamite and her family are the vineyard keepers. Apparently, when Solomon goes and he visits the vineyard up in Lebanon, he meets this beautiful young woman who is working in the fields. She is of the peasant class. Well, apparently it's love at first sight. And they strike up conversation. You can imagine this in your head. And ultimately, it leads to love, it leads to courtship, it leads to a wedding, and this peasant girl becomes the queen of Israel. And so it's really a fascinating, uh, intriguing love story, and it's really fun to just relive it as best we can as we piece together the events of this story. Now, the book itself is only eight chapters long. Song of Solomon is not that long. The Song of Songs is only eight chapters, and it develops in this major fashion. This is not original with me. In fact, I take this outline from that uh, preacher friend of mine that I first heard teach through this book and really help unlock for me the meaning of this book. But it's going to unfold in four major chunks. Chapters 1 and 2 is labeled as the pursuit of love. This is where they're not yet married. They're, this is the puppy love stage. This is where they're courting, they're dating, if you will. They are working towards marriage. The engagement scene is at the end of chapter 2. But then chapter 3 is what I call the promise of love. This is the actual wedding ceremony. This is where they swear an oath of allegiance one to another. And they promise to be one another's, um, you know, uh, th this, this idea of the wedding. Well, then chapter four is what you might label the pleasures of love. That is the honeymoon night. That's the wedding night. That is their first sexual encounter is in chapter four. Much to learn there. But then the major chunk of the book, and can we argue, is also sometimes the major chunk of marriage in general, is the problems that we must deal with and work through. The latter half of the book, Song of Solomon, chapters five through eight, is all about the problems of love. It's, it's going to record in chapter 5 their first major fight and falling out, but then it will record how they regain respect and reaffirm love for one another, rekindle intimacy, deepen their relationship, and pursue one another all over again. And so they come out stronger at, after putting their marriage back together than they were before. And that section is where it gets incredible, incredibly practical. It's all practical. But that is the section that deals with how to deal with conflict in our marriage. The theme of this book, as you can see up on the screen, the very top line, the theme of the book is all about maturing or advancing love. We're going to see this couple begin with lots of fears and insecurities. They're going to have a shallow puppy love stage of their love relationship which is going to then have to be tested, it's going to have to grow, and it's going to have to mature. And so they go from just a shallow form of puppy love, physical attraction, you know, infatuation, to then having to go forging through the fire, forging a genuine relationship, their love is going to blossom and mature and advance. And one of the easiest ways to see this is in three key verses in the book. You can see him right there up on the screen. In chapter 2 and verse 16, we'll get to it in due time, but Shulamite 
is speaking, and she says in verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds among the lilies. My beloved is mine, I am his. He feeds among the lilies. Now contrast that verse with a verse later in chapter 6 and verse 3. After their first fight, and as they start rebuilding their relationship, listen to this. Chapter 6 and verse 3 says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds among the lilies. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds among the lilies. <clears throat> Most people don't catch it until you slow down, you read very carefully. Those two verses, 2.16 and 6.3, are almost identical with one major difference. In chapter 2, verse 16, Shulamite says, My beloved is mine. Secondly, I am his. In chapter 6 and verse 3, that is reversed. Now she says, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. In other words, do you see what's going on? There is a reversal in the way she views the relationship. She now, she, in other words, love is maturing. It's blossoming, it's blooming, it's changing, it's deepening. The relationship is becoming more meaningful. Why? Because she is realizing that marriage is a commitment. It's something that requires a selfless sort of sacrifice. We are called to serve our spouse. That is what true love is. The Bible speaks, particularly in the New Testament, the Greek language has multiple terms for love in the Bible. And the one that we uh, think of often is the word phileo in Greek. It's the word that just means a friendship, a kinship, a, a, a fondness one to another, a brother-type love. Well, then you have you, this idea of eros. Eros is a Greek term that actually is where we get our English word erotic. It's actually a uh, sort of physical attraction and sexual love. But the highest form of love is described or encapsulated in the, word, the Greek word agape. Agape is a selfless, sacrificial sort of love. That is the sort of love where we lay down our life for someone else. We put their needs above our own. This is the sort of love that God calls us to all the time, but particularly in marriage. And it makes perfect sense. The way God has designed marriage, if you are only out to get what you want out of marriage, it will never work. Because you will have two people pulling in opposite directions. Because they're going to go after what they want. And what's going to happen is it's going to tear the marriage apart. But if we follow God's pattern and we love one another unconditionally and serve one another sacrificially, then now we are pulling towards each other. We're working as a unit. Because I serve my spouse and then my spouse serves me. If we follow that pattern and follow God's principles, then guess what? Both of us are being served. Both of us are having our needs met. We are serving one another, and it, it is reciprocal. That's the way God has designed marriage. And that's a discovery that Shulamite comes to, which begins to transform their marriage. But let me share with you that other final key verse, and that is in chapter 7 and verse 10, where Shulamite will say this. She says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Now get that. In this verse, she drops the possessives. She doesn't even say, my beloved is mine. Rather, she surrenders her own neediness. She serves her spouse, and she says, I am my beloved's. I am giving myself to my beloved. And then she says, his desire is toward me. She is totally secure and confident in this relationship. We'll talk about that more as we go, but relational insecurity, the fear that your relationship could disintegrate at any moment, that fear, that insecurity is a wedge that is driven between uh, spouses in a marriage. It's present in nearly every marriage to one degree or another. There are insecurities and fears and anxieties, and we need to learn to address those, to identify them, to address them, to deal with them. When we follow God's pattern, we can receive and achieve relational marital security. 
that Shulamite here expresses when she says, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. She has got total confidence that her husband, her spouse, Solomon, is infatuated with her, loves her, will serve her, is sacrificial toward her, and she is confident in this relationship and she can rest in that sort of unconditional love. That's the kind of marriage we all ultimately want. And this book helps us learn to get there. Let me just highlight for you one more little tidbit that I find rather fascinating before we jump into chapter one itself. And that is the names Solomon and Shulamite. Special attention is given to this in chapter eight and verse 10 of the book. But in this passage, chapter eight and verse 10 says this. Again, Shulamite speaking. 10b, the second half of the verse says this. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. And there's a clever little pun going on there that you might not catch unless you're reading the original Hebrew. But the word in Hebrew that's translated favor or peace is the word shalom. And the word shalom in Hebrew is, is much more... Because you and I, when we use the English word peace, we often think of tranquility or the absence of conflict. But shalom in Hebrew is a much fuller, larger concept. It's not simply the absence of conflict, but it is the presence of all that is good. It is the presence of blessing, etc. Shalom is the ideal existence. That's what everybody wants to have, in other words. Well, some of you might know this, but it's kind of a nifty little clever device that's used throughout the book. But the name Solomon, the name Solomon is actually a form of the Hebrew word shalom. Solomon means peaceable one. Well, to take it further, the term Shulamite, the name Shulamite, which is the name of his love, right? The wife, the queen in this book, Shulamite is the feminine form of of Solomon. In other words, we know that it's, and, and we know for, for a fact that Solomon was actually a title given to him later. His, his birth name was Jedediah. But the, and you can read that in the, in, in the historic books, but Solomon is a title given to him. Shulamite may well have been a title that he gave to her. We don't know if that's her real name, you know, birth given name or a title, uh, you know, like a, a beloved, you know, sort of term of endearment. Either way, it's a nifty little clever device what's going on. Solomon, Shulamite, both of their names mean peaceable. Masculine form, feminine form. Solomon, Shulamite. And when Solomon and Shulamite are peaceable and they come together, they have shalom. They have the perfect marriage when they do it God's way. And that's really the climax of the book. And that's where we're headed. That's why we're studying this, is so that we can learn and have uh, and learn to grow in our own marriages and enjoy the sort of marriage that God has designed for us. Now, with that said, if you've got a Bible, and I greatly encourage you to, to, to grab a Bible and follow along as I read and as we work through this. Go to chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 to 4. And we're just, what I want to do is I want to work through the first about five or six verses here of this chapter, and then we will we'll make some practical applications give you some tangible homework to do, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for session one here. But if you've got a Bible, look at chapter one, and verse one is just the, the heading, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. That tells us what it is, who wrote it. But now pick it up in verse two. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love you. Draw me, we will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. The upright love you. Now, as we open the book and we see the opening scene, which is recorded in verses 2 to 4, it's recording... Shulamite's probably her first visit ever to Jerusalem. Recall, she is from Lebanon, far to the north. She is a peasant uh, from the vineyards of Lebanon. But this is her first visit to the capital city of Jerusalem. We see, we, we, we get that tidbit from verse 4 that says that he, that is the king, is bringing me to his chambers, his palace. And so this is probably her first visit to Jerusalem. And what's fascinating is this scene, verses 2 to 4, is giving us, it's opening with Shulamite as our speaker, and it's giving us a glimpse into her thoughts 
emotions and longings. As the book opens, we see Shulamite just enamored with Solomon. She is attracted to him because of, number one, she's physically attracted to him, but number two, she's, and more importantly, she's attracted to his character. Do you see this? It says in verse 2, she says, it, it opens with kind of the thoughts and emotions of Shulamite when she says, let him kiss me with a kisses, plural, of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. She makes a correlation. She's, she's longing to, to uh, kiss Solomon. She's longing for that physical touch. And this is obviously underscoring the attraction that she has to Solomon, but she likens this sort of physical attraction and the allurement of their uh, of, of their love, she likens it to wine. This is one of the first metaphors that we account that we encounter in the book, but it's a powerful one, and this is one that you can take further in your own thinking and study. But just like wine is alluring and intoxicating and sweet and valuable, and it even takes time to to make and develop uh, and and process, etc. All of those things make a beautiful correlation to love. When we have that wonderful puppy love sort of attraction, you remember that? That idea is, is something it is. It's intoxicating. It's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's uh, something that is just incredibly alluring. And that is the experience of emotion that she is experiencing. And she is feeling swept off of her feet. And what we're going to see, she, as a vineyard hand, is going to use a lot of analogies and metaphors to a vineyard, just like here, making wine. That's a product of the vineyard. Well, she's going to use symbols that are very common to her, you know, things that she's familiar with. But that's a fascinating metaphor, but she goes on. Verse 3, she says, Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you? You see, she's not only physically attracted to Solomon, and we'll get a description of him later in chapter 5, but she's also attracted to him as a man. His character is of sterling quality. She likens his name, which is a word that can also, recall, in the Bible refer to someone's characteristics, but she, and reputation even, She's referencing Solomon's character and his reputation as being as valuable and fine as good ointment. Now, ointment is, of course, uh, olive oil in which there is some sort of spice mixed in. Olive oil was produced, even still is, in Israel to this day. Some of the best olive oil in the world comes from the nation of Israel. But in antiquity, it was known as liquid gold. The basis of the Israel's foreign trade was largely olive oil. And ointment is taking olive oil and mixing in some sort of spice, like myrrh or frankincense or something like that. But the point is, it's expensive. Why? Because those spices, though Israel could manufacture olive oil uh, locally, they had to import those spices from far away, probably from India or Saudi Arabia. And the point is, it was expensive. It was valuable. And so she is liking, likening Solomon's character as being of sterling quality, value. But not just something that is valuable, but something also that is obvious. He is known. He has a good, solid reputation. He is known as a man of character. Because she says, your name is as ointment poured forth. Have you ever spilled a bottle of cologne or perfume? I have. There was once I was going to college, and I had a, a bottle of cologne in my uh, my bag, and I was going up and down elevations, driving through Colorado, and the elevation change messed up my bottle, and it split open. And as a result, it spilled cologne everywhere, and it was a powerful, overwhelming smell that was obvious when it broke open. That's the point, is Solomon's character is of sterling quality. It's valuable, but it's obvious to everyone. He is known by this, which is why she says at the end of verse 3, and then it's repeated in verse 4, that the virgins love Solomon. It would be very imaginable that in ancient Israel, Solomon is the most eligible bachelor in ancient Israel. He is a young man. He is a handsome man. He's a wealthy man. He's a powerful man, and he's single. And so as a result, no wonder all the daughters of Jerusalem, all the young eligible women, were all fawning over Solomon. 
and she recognizes this. She recognizes, Shulamite recognizes that Solomon is a catch, that she has a wonderful privilege to have such a relationship with a godly man. Well, she then says, verse 4, draw me and I'll run after you. And the idea is she says, come, sweep me off my feet. That's what she wants. Every woman wants this. Every woman wants to be the princess. She all wants to be uh, sought after and pursued and cherished and loved. We'll talk about that much more in, in weeks to come. But that's what Shulamite says. Come, sweep me off my feet. And she says, bring me into your chambers. And she's visiting the palace. And the point is, this, this opening scene in verses 2 to 4 is a powerful window into the thoughts, emotions, and longings in the heart of Shulamite. But on the heels of this scene, we have the next couple of verses. And sorry about the typo there. It's not read verse 15 and 6. It's 5 and 6. All right, let's read this next scene. Verses 5 and 6. It says, Shulamite still speaking. I am black but comely, O you daughters of Jerusalem, in the tents of Kedar and the curtains of Solomon. Or excuse me, like the tents of Kedar uh, and as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me, and they made me the keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard have I not kept. Now think about this with me for just a moment. These two verses can be summarized as follows. You can see it right there on the screen. Number one, Shulamite addresses the daughters of Jerusalem in these verses. She turns and speaks to them in verse 5 and 6. And she speaks to them in order to defend her beauty. Defend her beauty. Do you see this? Now, as we already mentioned, the daughters of Jerusalem are the young, eligible women that are living in the city of Jerusalem. Now, try and imagine the scene. This is Shulamite's first visit to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital city of ancient Israel. She is a country girl. She's coming to the city. She is entering a new world. She's a fish out of water. And you can imagine, as Shulamite has caught the eye and attention of the king, which all these other women want, these women see Shulamite as their primary rival. She enters the city and she senses it right away. The daughters of Jerusalem glare at her. And that's what she, she, she feels, their judgment. She feels the edge of competition. And she, she feels like she must defend herself. She says, I am black, dark. In fact, some translations will say tanned. I am tanned, but beautiful, O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar or the curtains of Solomon. Don't look at me. Don't scorch me with your gaze because the sun has already looked upon me. I have already been tanned and burnt by the sun. Why? Why is she so tanned? Because, she says, my mother's children were angry with me. That's a reference to her brothers. We'll talk about them more in chapter 8. But she says, my mother's children were angry with me, and they made me the keeper of the vineyard. So she was out in the fields keeping the vineyard. She says, but my own vineyard, which she uses as a wordplay, a metaphor for her own body and her own appearance, she says, my own vineyard have I not kept. Now, a little tidbit that might be helpful for you to understand what's going on here is in antiquity, uh, in ancient Israel and other places, we see that the peasant class was known by their tan skin because they were outside working in the fields. They were the peasants. The upper class was less so. They were not as tan. They were of lighter skin. Why? Because they didn't have to work outside. They could live a life of luxury. And so when Shulamite walks into the city of Jerusalem and she sees these women judging her, sizing her up, because they're, you know, she's her new competition, their competition for Solomon, and she immediately goes on the defensive. And she feels like she must still defend her beauty, even though she is obviously of the lower class, and she feels like she's being judged, like somehow she doesn't belong in the city of Jerusalem with the eye and a fondness of King Solomon. Well, what this does for us is it introduces for us a key theme that I want to camp on here before we close. Think about this with me for just a second. I want to introduce to you this concept of insecurity. This is something that we all deal with, that we all struggle with to one degree or another. And you, as you're listening or watching this, you also have many insecurities in your heart and your life. You struggle with many different insecurities. 
What is an insecurity? An insecurity is an uncertainty or an anxiety about oneself. It's a lack of confidence. It's a feeling of vulnerability, like you're a fish in a fishbowl and everybody's watching and you're freaking out about it. Or, as, as we put there last, it's self-doubt. We all have insecurities about something in our life. Not always are we insecure about the same things, but we all have, to one degree or another, some insecurities. In fact, based upon multiple surveys that have been taken over and over and over again, most of them, they can change to one degree or another, but they pretty much give a, a clear picture. That the most common insecurities in women are as follows. Number one, always first on the list, is their looks. I am yet to meet a woman in marriage counseling when I don't ask them this, that do, they don't admit that, yes, they are insecure about their looks. And it doesn't matter. I've, I've interviewed, I mean, dozens of women in this sort of scenario, and it doesn't matter on where, from our cultural standpoint, where they fall on the spectrum of beauty, all of them are insecure about their looks, about their hairstyle, about their age, about their weight, about their, you know, clothes style, all of these things. Um... The, our society pushes this, and as a result, most women are extremely insecure and always measuring themselves up with other women, always lacking confidence in their looks, their beauty. Secondly, most common female insecurities revolve around male attention and relational stability. Women, they're insecure. They want to be noticed. They want in particular, men to notice them, to see them, to to recognize their beauty. And yet, it's kind of a two-edged sword, because on the one hand, our culture treats women as sexual objects that must be uh, beautiful in every modern sense of the, wor the word, and as a result, they, they, they want the, the men to look, and yet, on the other hand, they don't want to be treated like a sexual object. They want to be loved as a person. In other words, they want a real, genuine relationship. They want stability. Someone who actually loves them for who they are, who cherishes them, who, who uh, they want that feeling of safety in a relationship. And most are very insecure about that. They're, they fear that they don't really have the unconditional love of their spouse, or their boyfriend, or their father, or whatever the major male figure is in their life. Women struggle with this. All of them do. Many for their entire life. Get honest about this. If you're listening to this, I would have a very high wager that this, this is describing you. Typically, however, money and career, they do make the list on some, but they're typically last. Women are less uh, interested in those things. Contrast that with the man. Men are most commonly insecure based upon their achievements, possessions, or their perceived masculinity. When I, mean achieve, when I say achievement, I mean career recognition. Are you viewed as being good at what you do? You want to be viewed that way, but you're not sure if other people think that of you. You're not really confident in that area, perhaps. Or maybe it's your possessions. That the world says, particularly the American dream, says, hey, you should have lots of money, you should uh, have a nice uh, house and a nice car, and you measure yourself up. You measure up your, your worth against other men and other families based upon tangible things, like how much money you have, how big your house is, and how nice your car is. And you feel insecure if you don't quite measure up in one of those areas. Or, another example would be the male image, whatever our culture deems as being masculine, which it varies from culture to culture, but in our culture, many times it has to do with the physical prowess of an individual. Are you strong? Are you in good shape? Are you good coordinated? Were you a jock? Or maybe it's your intellectual dominance. Maybe you're a nerd. Maybe you're not physically dominant, but you're really smart, and so you can get by on your smarts. And you can, you can feel like you, you can have confidence in yourself because you're smarter than the guy sitting next to you. Or maybe masculinity today in our culture is, is all about, you know, or largely about emotional control. 
that it, you know, real men don't cry. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. But the reality is, all of us are, are full, to one degree or another, of self-doubt, of insecurity. We're not quite sure how we measure up with the world around us, just like Shulamite is experiencing here. But let me tell you, you in order to receive marital security, you must have personal security, which is anchored in your identity. What do I mean by that? Your identity, whether you realize it or not, everybody has an identity. It is that fact or characteristic about yourself that defines you. It's the thing to which you look to say, this is who I am. It gives you meaning and purpose in life. For instance, if I was to say to you, who is Michael Jordan? Or who is LeBron James? What's your go-to response? You're probably going to say, they are great basketball players, arguably the best of all time. Okay? It's a characteristic about themselves, an accomplishment. That's what defines them. If I ask you, who are you? Typically, you will say, well, I'm a father, right? I'm a dad, I'm a husband. Uh, you know, for me, I'm a pastor. That's my job. What's your job? We typically say, well, I'm a pastor. Or, you know, I, I, maybe you talk about your ethnicity. You know, hey, I'm Irish, I'm English, I'm Canadian, I'm American. You know, the whole point is, we are, our identity is who we think we are. And what is it that we find pride in? What is it that we find meaning in? Well, what's dangerous about this, all of us have an identity, whether you realize it or not, but most of us, to one degree or another, embrace a false identity. In other words, we look to something other than God to provide ultimate meaning and purpose for our life. Let me give us some examples. Here are some, these are the most common examples of misplaced identity. Number one, performance. People believe the lie that I am what I do. I am what I do. I am only as good as what I do. Well, there's a problem with that. What if you're a vegetable? What if you're in a car accident? What if you lose a limb? What if you, you can't do what you once were able to do? Do you now cease to have a purpose? Do you cease to have value as a human being? You see, that is a false place to put your identity. Secondly, possessions. People believe the lie. I am what I have. That's the American dream. That I am, my worth, my value, my meaning, and my purpose in this life is to accumulate and gather as much stuff as I can. And if I have a better car, bigger house, and more money than you do, I'm better than you. And that's where I place my identity. What happens if we have an economic crisis? What if, what if you lose your job? What if you have your house foreclosed on? What now you do cease to have a purpose to, to live? Do you cease to have any value as a human being? You see, that is shifting sands. You can't put your identity on those things. They're not solid. How about popularity? Number three, I am what others think. Are you the prom queen? The prom queen, king and queen? Great. Were you popular? Great. Most of us weren't. Most of us are just average people. We don't get a lot of attention. We don't get a lot of popularity. If you stake your meaning and value on what other people think about you, you will live in constant fear and dread. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 that the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. Meaning that when I live my life worried about what other people think, I fear what men think about me and I'm trying to always cower behind or live up to someone else's expectations, then it's a snare. It's a live trap. I'm, I'm caged in what someone else expects from me. And I can never live my life in freedom and joy and ultimately pursuing meaning and purpose. Some will say position. That I am what I have achieved. I'm this championship wrestler, basketball player, football star. Or I've climbed this high on the corporate ladder. Or whatever, you fill in the blank. But position. I am what I have achieved. Or lastly, some people say they place their entire identity in pleasure. I am what I feel. That if, you know, I, I and they, they either, and this is, this can go both extremes. People that say uh, they, they idolize good health. I am, if 
what I feel. I, I need to feel good. I need to be in good health. And if I have any sort of, of anomaly, if I'm too heavy, or if I'm not strong enough, if I'm, you know, if I have any sort of health compl complication, they start really cowering. And, and questioning their identity and questioning their existence, or they, they, people go the other way, that they just pursue hedonism. This is where drugs, alcohol, stuff like that, they just, they want that feel-good high. They think that's the purpose of their existence, is to feel good. And so they pursue whatever means necessary. They overeat, they gorge themselves, they whatever. They want that high, that feeling, that feel-good feeling of pleasure, and they make that their center value and purpose in life. But the point is, all of these are shifting sands. None of these are permanent. All of these are temporary. And so if you place your ultimate identity in any one of these things, you will ultimately come to ruin at, at one time or another. So to find individual and marital security, we must anchor our true identity. False identities lead to insecurities and they result in instability. But a true biblical identity is what will ground us, providing security and stability. Where I don't, it doesn't ultimately matter how much money I have, how healthy I am, what people think about me. I can live with joy, meaning, and purpose because I, I am secure. I am secure in my identity and I know who I am. And when that happens, when you have individual security, which is really our topic you know, at this moment, and then we'll talk about it later, how it impacts marital security. Because if you're an insecure person and you're looking to your spouse to provide meaning for you in this life, your spouse is a fallible person. They're, they're going to make mistakes. You will not find ultimate meaning and happiness in that. It just won't happen. But if you find ultimate meaning and security in God, then... As you do that as an individual, and both individuals do that in a marriage, now you can have marital security and stability. Because you're not looking to one another to give something that they cannot ultimately give. You're looking to God, and He provides meaning and purpose in your life. What do I mean by that? How can God be the source of our security? Let me put it this way. We need to anchor our identity in two big things. Number one, creation. Number two, redemption. In other words, you need to realize and embrace the idea that I am designed by God. God made me the way I am. I'm five foot six. I'm shorter than the average man. That's something that I used to, it used to really bother me. I used to think, oh man, I, you know, I'm the, the odd man out. I don't live up to everybody else. Man, they think, they just laugh at me. And, you know, I was insecure about that. But guess what? Then I discovered, wait a minute, God made me this way. God has a purpose for me being this way. It's all right. I have no control over my height. I have no control over these things. That's all right. And I can surrender that control to God. God made me the way I am. And he made you the way you are. You anchor your identity, number one, in creation. I am designed by God. I'm a masterpiece of God's creative activity. But secondly... We anchor our identity in redemption. I am not only designed by God, I am loved by God. God didn't just make me. God pursued me. In my sin, when I ran from him, God came after me. God sent his son, his only begotten son, to come into the world. He loved the world, the Bible says, so much that he sent his only begotten son so that... Whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. The reality is, I. it doesn't matter ultimately who in this world, humanly speaking, accepts me or rejects me because I am accepted and loved by God. Oh, that is freedom. There is freedom and joy in that reality. So here's your homework. Here's your homework assignment. You ready? Listen up. Write this down because this is what you got to do. Number one, review the list that I mentioned earlier of the most common insecurities with men and women. 
Identify your insecurities. Ask your spouse. Talk to each other. Admit your faults and fears. You gotta open up. Get transparent. Talk to each other. Say, hey, this is what I struggle with. And let your spouse say, yeah, you know, this is what I struggle with. And, and maybe I'm actually afraid about this. You know, I, I don't think we make enough money or we don't, you know, we, we don't, we spend it too, too much. Or, you know, I, I, I'm afraid that we don't have good health, you know, we don't have good enough health care. Um, you know, and, I mean, what are your insecurities? I don't, I don't like the way I look. Now, I feel insecure about this. I feel like, you know, you as a spouse just look to me as a slave, not a friend. Whatever your insecurities are, talk about it. Talk about it. Identify, do the best you can, you can to identify your insecurities and then go deeper. Find your misplaced identity. List it. Write it down. Talk to each other. And write down your top two or three insecurities. Identify where you've placed your false identity. And when you do that, as a couple, each of you individually, and you know, do it together, your team here. But then secondly, what you need to do now is to pursue an understanding of your true identity in Christ. Pursue an understanding of your true identity in Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, again, you are created by God, you are redeemed by God. If you're a Christian, if you're here today and you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, you don't even know what it means to be a Christian. You don't understand when I use the term gospel and salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. If you don't understand those statements, then come talk to me. We, we need to sit down. We need to rehearse the gospel. But you don't have to come to me. Do it on your own. Pick up a Bible. Carefully read through Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. Not only does it articulate beautifully what the gospel is, but what our ultimate destiny is in Christ. That we have been granted forgiveness of sins, an inheritance in heaven. We have an eternity to look forward to. Look at all you are in Christ. Make a list. I've done this, and I've found over, it's like, I, I forget, 26 different things, I think, or maybe I'm up to 30 right now. Things that I have found in just those three chapters of what is true about me and how God loves me, redeemed me, forgives me, gave me an inheritance, etc., etc., etc. Make a list just from those, cha those chapters on who you are in Christ, what God has done for you, and form, begin to form your thinking and anchor your identity to God and His Word. But let me make one more recommendation before we close, and that would simply be this. I recommend this to several people. It is called the Gospel Primer. The Gospel Primer, or a Gospel Primer, by Milton Vincent. You see that? Um, this is, it's not that big. It's a very readable, short little read. It is Milton Vincent's Meditations on the Gospel and how the Gospel forms our identity and our purpose in this life. And it has been, I, I, I recommend this over and over and over to people. I've read it multiple times myself. I'm always going back to it. It's a very helpful resource in this area to basically say, okay, who am I in Christ? And help me, it helps me, and hopefully it will help you, learn to forsake false identities and to embrace true identities in Christ for the glory of God. And when you find personal security in Christ, in God, then you can then find marital security and stability. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time here today. Thank you, Lord, for these precious truths that we work through. Lord, we ask that you would equip us in the sessions to follow as we go through this SOS couples course, as we think through the book of Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, as we try to glean from its principles and apply it to our life. I pray for our marriages. Lord, I pray for, for this couple, these couples that will be listening to this course, that you would help them to think through these issues, pray through these issues, to come to you, find your grace, to find personal security, to begin to invest in their marriage and piece back together 
their marriage, all for your glory. So Father, we ask for your grace and we commend ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Please tune in next time as we do session two.